It is my pleasure to um, introduce Valentina Shin. Um, she is here to um, give us a talk on uh, convenient and accessible audiovisual media. She's uh, interviewing for a postdoc position here. Um, and uh, so she's going to be finishing up the summer, summer I think, yes. uh, at MIT. Mm -hmm. um, she's a student of Frito Duran, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I will just leave it to her. If you, if anybody has any questions, you want to chat with her later as well. Uh, let me know. I think we might have a little bit of time, and we can set that up. But um, we're already running a little bit late, so uh, okay. please. Let's Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm Valentina, and um, I am currently a student at MIT, and um, will be graduating this June. But I'm originally from South Korea. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about my research, which is looking at ways to make creation and manipulation of audiovisual media easier and more accessible. So why audiovisual media? We spend a tremendous amount of time both as consumers of audiovisual media, looking at YouTubes, listening to podcasts, or editing home videos, and also as producers of audiovisual media. It takes painfully long hours to create a good quality audio or video. And these are some figures from my formative interviews from some of my previous work, as well as research from other people. But we all know by experience that it can take hours to create a good minute of video or good quality audio. It's difficult for novice users, but also for professionals, it's a labor-intensive task. So there's a lot to gain by making audiovisual media easier. I think manipulating audiovisual media should be as natural and simple as writing or sketching. So consider a text document. It's one of the most accessible medium to deal with. First of all, it's easy to navigate. You can easily skim or search through a document. And it's also straightforward to edit and keep track of those edits. And this simplicity extends itself to collaboration so that many people can work on the same document at the same time at ease. And this ease of use is what enabled people to make new types of media, such as the wiki, where millions of people contribute all online to create a document that evolves over time. So my question is, what does it make to take to make audiovisual media as easy and simple to create, edit, and navigate? So let's look at some of the difficulties that we have with audiovisual media now. First of all, it's difficult to navigate. Audiovisual media is usually associated with time, which gives it a natural dimension. So the most natural way to navigate it is linearly according to its timeline. And that's what the play button does. But sometimes we want, so, so to speak, unnatural navigation, like scrubbing through or jumping back and forth to specific parts. And right now, with the interface that we have, these um, are not as convenient as we'd like to. So both videos or um, waveform representations of audio is not an easy representation to skim or search through the content. Another factor that affects audiovisual media is its multimodal nature. So for instance, in a video, we have the image frames, we have the audio sources, and graphic elements such as the subtitles. And these elements are all related to each other in the extra dimension, which is time. So editing one modality has to affect the other modality. And this is true even for audio sources without any image frames. When the audio contains multiple tracks, editing usually involves synchronizing and aligning the different tracks. So operation on one of the tracks has to affect the others as well. So the multimodal nature of media coupled with time makes them a rich and attractive source of data, but it also makes it difficult to operate on. So in my research, I look at ways to turn these challenges into opportunities. So I try to take advantage of the multidimensional and multimodal nature of the, of the media. So more specifically, the different elements that make up audiovisual media are related to each other in space and time. So a simple example would be in a video, adjacent image frames tend to be related to each other. Or in audio, there can be natural pauses in between the audio, which gives it some natural structure. So I try to see where are these structure to infer them and to take advantage of them in my tools. And secondly, different modalities have different potential to assist user tasks. So for example, the audio can be a good way of conveying tonal nuances or the natural flow of sound. But maybe a more static representation like text could be better for skimming or searching. So we look at ways to use these complementarity to reinforce user tasks. And finally, I take a hybrid approach of mixing direct manipulation with automation. 
it's important for users to feel that they have direct control over what they're navigating or editing. Um, but uh, automation can help with the tedious or repeated parts of the task. So I'm going to share with you today some of my work which apply these approaches to specific application domains. These domains are speech recordings, lecture videos, and presentations. And the first area I will talk about is speech recordings. This is based on a work that was presented at the WIST conference last year, and it's a collaboration with Lou Motley at Adobe. So the task we're looking at is authoring speech recordings. And here, this, um, there are several parts to the task. One is working with the script, so writing and editing the script. And the other part is working with the audio, recording the audio and then editing it. And in our formative interviews, we noticed that this is not a straightforward linear task. People go back and forth between working with the script and working with the audio, and both evolve over time. And a major problem that makes the task very difficult is that it's difficult to iterate between the two, the script and the audio. So to begin with, first of all, um, most existing tools don't deal with both. People typically write the script in one application, like Microsoft Word, and then we'll deal with the audio in a different application, like Adobe Premiere, for instance. Scripting is done with text, uh, whereas most audio editing tools deal with audio waveforms. So there's extra work to translate and relate one representation to the other. But most importantly, we notice that the script and the audio don't actually match. So it's um, very common for people to improvise during the recording. So for example, here on the script, the user wrote, there were many wars and fierce battles. But during the recording session, they improvise a little bit and say, wars and fierce battles continued on for ages. And there's a discrepancy between the two now. Another common um, scenario would be, for instance, when you're making a video for paper submission, you might just have a simple outline in the script. Users iterate back and forth. But then when you're recording, you um, expand on this part and say, typically users iterate back and forth between the script and the audio. And finally, you might not have a script at all, but just start improvising the audio. And now some um, discrepancy is necessary. What happens now if I or my collaborator wants to make detailed edits to the wording of the audio, it's not straightforward. First, I have to listen through the audio to know what's recorded. And then I have to mark the place I want to re um, edit by marking either its timing or by transcribing what was in the audio. And then I would mark the edits, what I want to change in the text. And then I go through a similar process to incorporate these edits. I have to re-record this portion, scrub through the audio to find the timing, and then carefully cut and paste in the um, new version. And as you can imagine, these tasks become more tedious if there are multiple people working on the same recording, or if there's more discrepancy between the script and the audio. So our goal was to design an interface that integrates scripting, audio recording, and audio editing as smoothly as possible. And the first key idea was to unify the representation of the script and the audio using text. So we achieved this by using speech-to-text, um, automatic speech recognition. So with the advance of speech recognition in general, the idea of using text to represent speech it has been explored by previous researchers. But what's different here is that most of these research focused on editing a pre-recorded speech using its transcript. And in our case, we wanted to also include the scripting process itself into the interface and how the script edits and audio edits affect each other. So the new idea that we offer is instead of keeping a separate representation for the script and the audio transcript, we merge the audio transcript into the script. And we call this the master document in our interface. So the master document will represent both the audio that's being recorded and the script that the person has planned to record. Um, and all of these will become more clear later when I go through a demo. So effectively, this merges the two modalities of typing the script and recording the audio. And editing the text will affect the underlying audio, and recording the audio will affect the update, the master document text. Now, when the user records the audio, we obtain the audio transcript using speech recognition. And we need to somehow merge this audio transcript with the master document, which will contain the original script to begin with. And this is where the last key idea comes in. 
we provide an automatic alignment algorithm to assist this task of merging. So before I describe in more detail about how the system works, let me show you a demo of our system. So first of all, this is what our interface looks like. On the left-hand side, you have the master document. And on the right-hand side is where the audio transcripts will go. And both are empty to begin with. The user can start by writing the script. It can be a simple outline of bullet points. And then once the script is done, the user can press record to record the first take. And the speech recognition will process the speech and provide an automatic transcript. And the user can record another take. Um, so, so this is what the interface will look like after I've recorded three different takes. OK, so this is take one, take two, take three. And each take is associated with the recording. Speech recordings are a common form of communication in modern media. Mm -hmm. And what's not clear in this view is the relationship between how the transcript relates to the original script. But if I turn on the alignment, um, our algorithm aligns each segment of the audio transcript to a segment in the master script. And um, it will also visualize parts that are improvised in the audio take and parts that are in the script but was not recorded in this particular audio take. And since I have multiple takes um, based on the same script, if I go to the All tab, it will summarize for each section of the takes um, similar takes of the same part of the script. So I can compare and choose. And to compose the final um, recording, I can go ahead and accept parts that I like from each take. And this the system will take care of cutting the right portion and merging them. So here you see a part that has not been recorded in any of the takes. So let me try to go ahead and record this take. We take advantage of automatic speech recognition to transcribe speech recordings into text. And as the system processes, it also will try to align um, the speech with the right portion of the script. So I don't have to go ahead and um, so I can just go ahead and accept it, and it'll put it into the right place. And um, we can try to listen to some part audio of Audio as completely separate entities. We take advantage of automatic speech recognition mm -hmm. to transcribe speech recordings into text. Our interface. OK. Um, so let me go back to the presentation. So here's an overview of our system. First of all, we have the master document, which functions as an enhanced edit text editor that's coupled with audio. And when a user uh, records a take, um, we obtain the audio transcript using speech recognition. And this transcript is linked to the audio file. Specifically, we keep track for each word where um, it occurs in the audio file, the timestamp. Um, the audio transcript is linked to the master document by alignment. The alignment links each segment of the audio transcript to segments of the master document. And if we record multiple takes of the audio, each audio transcript is linked separately to the master document. And this um, alignment is computed dynamically each time the master document is updated. So for instance, if I want to accept a segment of the audio transcript, it will replace the corresponding portion of the master document, link it to the um, audio source, and then the, we will recompute the segmentation and alignment. So let me point out a few things about this alignment algorithm, which is the core technology enabling the interface. Um, the main challenge comes from the fact, as I mentioned in the intro, that the script and the audio transcript won't match exactly. So there will be parts that roughly correspond. There will be parts that are improvised and vice versa, parts that are missing from the audio. Another consideration we want to take into account is the natural structure in the speech. So for example, in case of typed text, this means respecting punctuation boundaries in sentences. And in case of spoken text, Sorry, this means respecting natural pauses in speech. For, and we have to take both of these into account. So for instance, if we only take into account punctuations, this is the segmentation we get. And the left-hand side looks natural, but on the right hand, there's an unnatural cut in the middle of a spoken sentence. So if we were to merge this segment 
but then use a different segment for the subsequent part of the recording, we will get, we will hear an unnatural cut in the missentence. sentence. On the other hand, if we only consider pauses in spoken speech, we will get an unnatural cut in the middle of a written sentence. Uh, and finally, our end goal is to segment the two texts and then align them. So we want a consistent segmentation between the two documents. And this can conflict with the earlier goal of respecting natural boundaries. So let's say here, if we segment these two texts according to their natural boundaries, this is what we get. And since the left-hand side has two segments, but the right-hand, the audio speech, is consists of only one segment, we can, if, when we merge the audio transcript into the master document, we can't decide, or it's harder to decide which segment to replace. So since there's not a perfect um, alignment and match, we solve this as an optimization problem and design a scoring function. I won't go into the details of this scoring function, except I just want to point out that the first um, term um, tries to separate improvised segments from recorded sections that have a correspondence. And the second term favors segments at natural boundaries, punctuations and pauses. And the third term takes care of the consistency between the two documents. The last term is just a normalization term to prevent us from getting single word segments. As a result, we get the a alignment between the two documents. And the algorithm can handle rough correspondence and visualize improvisation and unrecorded sections. And we group multiple takes from different audio takes so that the user can compare easily and take the best one. To evaluate our system, we conducted two different types of user studies. One was a overall usability study, and the other was comparing it with a state-of-the-art tool, which was also text-based speech editing. And today, I'm just going to focus on the first of these studies. Um, the user task here was to create an audio recording using our interface. So we gave them a short tutorial and an article that they were going to create a recording about. And the users created the recording based on this article. And during this process, they were discouraged from just reading out the article aloud so that they could go through their own scripting process. And the most exciting observation from this study was that they went through a very different workflow, although they had the same task. And VoiceScript was able to support all of these different workflows. So for instance, in scripting, some people were, would write a very rough outline of what they were going to record, whereas others would write a very detailed script word for word. And some people didn't write a script at all, but would improvise and then take that improvised um, transcript as their first draft of the script and then continue to refine. In recording, some people used to record a portion of the script at a time and then do another take, whereas others prefer to record the entire script and then go on. Also for editing, some people liked to record everything and then merge them into a final track whereas other people liked to merge portions at a time and mix that with recording. And also, all of these processes were not linear, but people went back and forth between scripting, recording, and editing. And since our interface doesn't assume any particular workflow, it could accommodate all of these different workflows, especially the master script played an important role because it can accommodate all stages of the script and all types of script, from detailed to outlines. So let me summarize by going back to the three principles I mentioned in the introduction. The important structure for our task is the relationship between the script and the audio. And the alignment algorithm is an example of inferring and exploiting the structure. When we compute alignment, we take into account the natural structure in the text and speech. And then we visualize them um, in a spatial way that's immediately useful for the task of merging. The algorithm is an also an example of using automation to handle tedious tasks. The most tedious part of editing audio is aligning different tracks, cutting the right portion, and merging them in. But now this is taken, uh, taken care of automatically, and the user can focus on filling in the content with the best take. And finally, the master document is an example of promoting synergy between two modalities. By unifying the, um, and linking the audio with the written text, it's natural for users to go back and forth between scripting and audio recording. The second domain I will talk about is videos, and in particular, lecture videos. So this is a part that's based on a work that was presented at SIGGRAPH Asia in 2015. 
So here the task we're looking at is watching lecture videos. So let's say I want to brush up on the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I found this video from Khan Academy, and let's watch a little bit of the video. Hey, I have some function f that is continuous, continuous on an interval, continuous on an interval between a. So I can watch the entire video, but what I'd really like to do is find out what this video is going to cover and then get right to the point, the fundamental theorem. So in other words, I want to get a quick summary or search for a specific point. And in some cases, people prefer to read um, textbooks or read the lecture note because it's a way for them to control their speed where they can digest their content. Let's see what we can do with current interfaces. So I can scrub through the timeline, but this doesn't let me hear the audio or see the images clearly. I can also randomly access points, but again, I don't have a good sense of where in the timeline to click for the information that I want. Some platforms come with a um, tool where I can choose the playback speed, but it still takes time to listen to the entire lecture. And also, some platforms provide interactive transcripts, and I can skim through the transcript, but this doesn't let me compare the visuals um, clearly at the same time. So all of these interactions are not very efficient for what I want, and it's actually somewhat disappointing. It seems like, at least in terms of functionality, the video browsers we use today are pretty much similar to the video cassette players we used in the 80s. And I think we can do better. So our solution was to design a navigation interface that's more focused on the content. And if you think about it, lecture contents are pretty different from other types of movies we watch. So compare this movie. To this video. Fundamental theorem. <laughs> um, it's very different. So, first of all, the visuals are very static in lectures. They are drawn continuously, but once they're drawn and appear on the board, they don't change or move about. And the audio content consists almost entirely of speech, which is also closely related to the visuals on the board. And finally, lectures tend to present information in a linear fashion. So, our interface is based on these characteristics. And we transform the video into a more readable format that resembles lecture notes. Uh, here's a demo of what it looks like. First of all, here's a screenshot of the original video, uh, the final screenshot of the Blackboard. And then here's what it looks like after the transformation. So our interface um, interleaves text with figures from the video. And some of the text is hidden by default. And pressing this button will bring up some of the text that is hidden. And you can also, so you can read through the interface, but you can also play the video by clicking on any part of the image or the text. This right over here is the graph of Y And is the video will play in line. T. Now, our Lower end point is A, so that's A it's right over there. Get an idea of what it's Our... like. So the video plays in line on the figures, and it will continue on to the next figure. So there's um, the visual transcript is generated automatically, given an input video and its transcript. And there's two parts, extracting the figures and then um, structuring the text into short paragraphs and hiding some parts of the text. Take, uh, text. So I'm going to go through just to point out a few parts about each of these tasks. So the challenge in extracting figures is that they are drawn non-linearly in space and time. And this video will illustrate that point. So here, notice how the user goes back and forth between working on the equation below and then annotating the diagram above. So annotating and working on the equation. And again, in this case, uh, he's annotating the equation, drawing some diagram, going back to some empty space, and then working on the first diagram as well. So the figures are drawn nonlinearly in both time and space. Um, we looked at this as a segmentation problem, and again, we solve uh, it as an optimization. We design a scoring function that takes into account both the temporal and spatial characteristics of the drawings. So for instance, how compact each figure is, what is the temporal and spatial gap between the figures, so on and so forth. And here's a screenshot of the previous video. 
And this is what the visual transcript output looks like. Here the instructor draws the diagram and then works on this equation and then goes back to the diagram. So we separate the two stages of the diagram so that each step is clear. And in the second stage, we only highlight the new parts of the diagram, which are the arrows. For audio analysis, we exploit the temporal correspondence between the drawings and what the instructor is speaking. So when the instructor speaks and writes at the same time, they tend to be speaking about what they're drawing. So here he's saying, let's say I have some function f that is continuous on an interval between a and b, which is what he actually drew at the same time. And when he is talking but not writing at the same time, it tends to be something that explains the drawings or connects them. Um, so here he's explaining that the graph he's going to draw next is the graph of f that he just explained. And likewise, while he's drawing the graph, he's just explaining the drawing. So from the temporal correspondence, we divide the sentence into two parts. One that is explaining the figures and that's kind of redundant. And the other that connects the figures and reinforces the explanations. And by default, we hide the redundant descriptive sentences behind its figure, which can be expanded when the user wants. So here's a few more examples of visual transcripts. We tested our algorithm on 20 different videos from 10 different authors to make sure that the algorithm can accommodate different author styles. Okay. To summarize, we propose visual transcript as a convenient way to, um, to search, skim, and navigate lecture videos. We use spatial and temporal structure to extract key figures and organize the text into paragraphs and to remove redundant text. We make use of different modalities. So by using a static arrangement of figures and text, we make it a readable format where it's easy to skim and search, but also people can go back and forth between reading and watching the video. And in this case, all the process of generating was done automatically, and the user only interacts with the final output. The final domain is about presentations. And this part is a sneak peek into a current work in progress. So we do presentations all the time, like I'm doing now. And the two most common type is doing slide presentations or working with Blackboard or Chalkboard. So this is a photo of John Wheeler, who's a physicist who popularized the term black hole. And his style was to fill the Blackboard with neat diagrams before the lecture and go through them. So he was an exception in that he used the chalkboard kind of like a PowerPoint. But usually, a typical Blackboard-style presentation would look more like this. It's more improvised. If we compare the two styles of presentations, the slide presentation um, takes more time to prepare, and it is more polished. Whereas chalkboard presentations can be done with less preparation beforehand, but it does require more effort during the time of the performance. The advantage is that you can be more flexible to interact with the audience and accommodate their needs. So, and that, for that um, reason, it's arguably more engaging. So what we aim to do in our current research is to take the best of both worlds. We want to develop an interface for presentation um, that is flexible, but also helps people during the performance not to have too much cognitive load. And existing tools allow users to mix the two styles by allowing people to ink on top of slide but we feel that they don't address the challenge that presenters have when they're writing on the fly. Um, we don't just want to enable presenters to write on top of slides, but we want them to write well. And writing well on the fly is difficult because, first of all, it's difficult to remember what to write. And it's also difficult to plan the layout on the fly, so where to put what. But even if you can do both, remember and lay it out, um, it's hard to execute your plan on the fly because sometimes your writing might become too big and you run out of space, or your writing might get slanted. And also because you're talking at the same time. And finally, there are things you cannot plan ahead. So if you want to add extra content in response to an audience question or things like that. So um, our approach is to assist writing on the fly mainly in two ways. First, by dynamically managing the layout so users can adjust the layout on the fly, and then also by taking advantage of the prepared contents. So here's a demo to illustrate some aspects of these ideas. Let's see. OK. 
okay so the left hand side is the speaker view and the right hand side is the audience view and you will notice that some parts some of the parts that are in gray here are not shown in the audience view and unlike um, traditional presentation you don't have to decide the order of what will be shown and you can just be more flexible with to show or things on uh, show or hide things on the fly that's one aspect of being flexible but another part is when writing so for instance I want to write this I can write very big or small and as you notice on the right hand side it's being fitted in real time to the box that I had planned ahead. Mm -hmm. And let's say this is a lecture about um, the binary search tree. And I say I talked about all of this. And one of the questions came up that, how do you define a height of the tree? So I want to make some room to explain that. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to make some room here to define the height and see is it gonna work okay so it's a little slow right now as it's a work in progress but it'll make room for an extra thing so I can write height is path from root to leaf okay and again it'll fit into the right place and you can imagine things like here um, I can try to draw a bunny and people will not notice that I am tracing on top of an image and think I'm a very good bunny drawer <laughs> or things like that. But um, going forward, we want to look at ways to be more predictable with layout management. Right now, we're just using an uh, optimization to do the layout and also looking at ways to beautify the writing in different ways by taking advantage of what's prepared below. Oh, PowerPoint stopped working. Sorry. Let me restart. Okay. Huh. Okay. Okay. okay, so I started with a broad goal of making audiovisual media as natural and easy as writing or sketching. And I looked at three specific application domains where we can facilitate user tasks by really taking advantage of the specific workflow and the characteristics of each media. And moving forward, my long-term vision is to enable anybody, novice users, professional users, or people with disabilities, to create and manipulate audiovisual media. And achieving this goal will have challenging problems in user interface design, in data representation, and structure. So continuing to improve usability for single users with varied skill levels, as well as supporting communication and collaboration for multiple users will be both critical. And the three principles that I referred to previously can also be revisited through the lens of how they can empower users even further. So for example, the taking advantage of temporal and spatial structure. I mentioned in the beginning of the talk that um, audiovisual media is difficult to navigate. So unlike photos, which can be viewed at once, um, audiovisual media, you need to actually navigate through the media to look at all of its contents. And if the user is familiar with the source to begin with, this can be easier because they can take advantage of their unique knowledge. But in, for example, if multiple people are involved, this is more difficult because you're dealing with a source that has been edited by someone else or you have not authored in the first place. So people need a better way to navigate audiovisual media sources. Um, people sometimes use simple tricks. This is a photo from Udacity Recording Studio. And when the instructor makes a mistake during the recording, they would press this bell, which has a unique sound profile and alerts the video editor later on which, which places to look out for. Um, so in our work on speech recording interface, we also looked at ways for, through different representation, text representation and visualization, aligning things and um, showing them side by side, 
all as a way of making it easier to navigate a source. And this also helped people. We originally had a single user in mind, but this also helped people to collaborate asynchronously. And I want to look at ways to use this type of structure inside the tools to help people navigate media in a smart way. Secondly, taking ad advantage of multiple modalities. So as I mentioned, different modalities have different potential to assist user tasks. We saw, for instance, how static representations can facilitate video navigation, or how text representation can facilitate speech editing. Um, a similar principle applies on the side of interaction. For instance, professional users may be more efficient at using keyboard shortcuts or navigating complicated menus. But novice users may benefit from a natural language interface that interprets vague commands. And likewise, different modes of representation and interaction can benefit people with different levels of skills. And finally, taking the hybrid approach of mixing automation um, with direct manipulation. And this is not new at all. It's one of the reasons we use computers. But I think there are major challenges specifically in the audiovisual media domain. And one such challenge is developing personalized automation. So people with different skills or accessibility need different type of automated assistance. And in each case, the automation should be as flexible as possible for user input at various parts of the process. And currently, most of the uh, automatic algorithms provide very limited control for the user, for example, by setting parameters in the beginning. But there are many ways to make that more flexible. Empowering users to work effectively on audiovisual media in an easy and natural way will also enable them to create new types of media that was not possible before and through new ways of working. So today I shared with you a first step towards this goal through novel interfaces um, that address challenges in specific domains. And I would like to make real impact um, by creating efficient tools for various different types of media. And finally, before I open up for questions, I would like to thank all of my colleagues and mentors who I was very fortunate to work closely with. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. That was great. Thank you. I really, really liked uh, voice script because I, I do that all the time on my presentation. I record, mm -hmm. and then I listen to my ad libs, and then reintegrate. So mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, I can't wait to use this <laughs> for one. Um, but one thing, one thing I do in addition to the audio is think about the PowerPoint visuals as well, like mm -hmm. the, the scheduling the builds and mm -hmm. the slide transitions. Mm -hmm. And have you thought about integrating that into the voice script yes. workflow so that you could then automate when those builds happen or have the voice activate those builds? Right, right. Um, that's interesting. The, one, uh, the motivation behind the project was for recording lecture videos. So we did have visuals in mind, but we narrowed down and focused on the speech part. Um, there are many parts. If it's dealing with slide presentations, you can um, definitely think about um, activating the animations with the voice if you have a script in mind. But also if you were saying recording a of lecture video and drawing the animations. There was an um, interesting pr um, people, people we were interviewing were, some of them were making these lecture videos. And one strategy there was, since it's hard to draw animation and speak at the first time, in the first round, they would record the speech and they would just scribble around on the blackboard. And then they would go and edit these um, scribbles later on. Um, here, I think also the difficult part is timing of the animation and matching that with the script. So some way to decouple that and make automation, make uh, take advantage of automation to take care of that would be a good thing. And also being able to edit parts of the animation going back without affecting the timing of the transcript would be another addition. Yeah. So that's an interesting problem. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the when you were uh, discussing the video transcripts, mm -hmm. um, that one of your goals is searchability. Mm -hmm. um, is there uh, plans or already the functionality for keyword searchability? Some of those transcripts look really long, and I can mm -hmm. imagine someone wanting to find one specific mm -hmm. point. Right. So right now, it's just simple. You do Control F and search as you search a website. Um, I can imagine there can be different um, visualizations to summarize all the parts with these, these keywords. 
or um, look at all the figures that are related to these keywords. It's not implemented yet, but it's definitely a possibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was good. to that point, I was going to mention that there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a conference, Open Viz conference, mm -hmm. for all their videos mm -hmm. that they post afterward. They do a keyword visualization for every video, and you can navigate it non linearly that way through the, a cloud of keywords and mm -hmm. it links to different parts of the, of the linear timeline. So, having a pair between linear and searchable word cloud or ranked list of keywords would be helpful for just searching. Mm -hmm. yes. Has anyone done any sort of validation of work on using? Social cues to navigate the video. Because, for example, it seems like for a really popular video on mm -hmm. YouTube, that you know lots of people are probably trying to find mm -hmm. you know the same like points of mm -hmm. interest, and in sure they're going to scrub around a lot to find them, but eventually they're all going to like right. narrow it and stop mm -hmm. on the same points, and then presumably right. you could reflect mm -hmm. that. There was some work done on that with Chuho Kim. Um, he worked on MOOC videos in particular, and he had an idea of looking at these data from MOOCs where people view most frequently, where do people stop, and had a different timeline that had some friction so that people would navigate toward, um, be able to see, okay, what do other people view most, and where are the important parts and things like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. with, with the video transcripts, mm -hmm. um, did you do any sort of evaluation afterwards, like having students, mm -hmm. you know, watch the videos with that interface versus yes. other interfaces? Or... So we did a comparative study using um, the YouTube interface, the most standard one. And there was a different work that was summarized Blackboard style lecture videos by taking a panorama of the Blackboard and providing a separate transcript. Um, and there, what we looked at was two things. One, which interface is best for searching and which is good for summarizing the lecture video. And for the search task, we looked at two, um, actually three different types of questions. One was visual search, things you could search by just looking at the figures. The other was um, textual search, so having to look, listen to the audio. And the other was um, contextual, so people had to see both the visual and the text and relate them to get the question. So we um, would come up with questions from these different type of search questions and compare them. Mm -hmm. Just, just to follow up on, mm -hmm. on that project, mm -hmm. were you doing anything with with um, any kind of text reco of the blackboard? Because you've mm -hmm. got the blackboard itself, and there's right. there's there's information there mm -hmm. that you might want to search on, mm -hmm. but obviously you don't want. You know, I mean, you're going to have mistakes in that reco as well. Right. So mm -hmm. did, did you do anything with that, or were you thinking mm -hmm. about it? Or? We thought about it, but we didn't go to that route. We felt like most of the text is also represented in the transcript. Mm -hmm. So they would say things out loud as they're doing. But it, is an, it would be another interesting area where you can really um, reduce redundant information from the transcript and audio, and also have a better way of unifying the two modalities. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. I think that where that's probably a, more important mm -hmm. is for prepared like PowerPoint, mm -hmm. things like that, yeah. where you often don't speak out Right. Because I guess in a blackboard, you, you're mm -hmm. often saying what you're writing. Mm -hmm. right. um, but I can imagine that, I think in PowerPoint, you're much more often, it's just there. It's there, yeah. And then I speak out whatever I'm speaking. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, it's probably also a lot easier yeah. than PowerPoint, because mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. record's going to go a lot yes. easier. <laughs> Another in interesting but related problem there, what we explored was looking at ambiguous pronouns, because in the Blackboard, they would say things like, oh, here, look at here, this part of the diagram. So what we, we tried to do there was localize the pointers when that word was occurring, and try to annotate the diagrams using like A, B, C. So figure 2A is what this person is saying, and here. So that was an, an area we did explore, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.